Going down to the seashore, nine-year-old Dalen finds himself there again, running away from the children of Bodhi, the temple of the arts, because he hates being with them. Lanari goes to where her brother was. Even though she was yelling at him and getting closer, he didn't notice her. Dalen was standing next to a circle made of maple fruit. He always does when he's thinking. An alarm sounded to rouse her from her sleep. Lannery had dreamed of her brother. She did it very often, but the dreams were of the time when everything was wrong. The Jedi was headed for Titan, the fifth planet in the Titan system. The Jedi Council had given her the order to return to the planet for a mission they had for her. For many rangers, returning to Titan meant returning to home, to family connections, to training, or immersing themselves in the planet's force affinity environment. Lannery, aboard her customized Peacemaker class cruiser, rises from her cot and enters her cutter with her maintenance droid, a customized Holgorian IM-220 with heavy yellow armor and padded metal feet. Iron Hulks, how long until Titan? she asked. The droid beeped and clicked answering Lannery. She walked down the hallway of her ship and passed different doors that held her personal possession, a small cover pedestal, and a closet where she kept her things. Lannery went to the forward cockpit, turned on the control panel and looked at the view ahead of her, full of stars. On a screen she could see a red spot, surrounding a bluish sphere. It was Titan. It was three hours away from there. She knew nothing about the mission, the only thing was that this task had to be discussed face to face. Lannery was excited to be back. She wanted to see her parents after four years, and besides, she was the only daughter. They surely miss her. At that moment, a communication came in transmission. She looked at the scream, and it was Master Dampo. A Jedi of the Cutter species, Lannery was surprised by the honor of being received not by a simple ranger but by a Master Jedi. The Master greeted her and told her that they were happy she had arrived on the planet, but regretted on meeting again in a better situation since there were urgent matters to attend, dark matters. In addition, the Master informed her that she will be meeting not only with her, but also with six Masters, including the Master of the Temple Staff Kesh, Master Lamy. Dample was happy to see her again since she had been his teacher long ago. She sent her the coordinates of the meeting point, being 19 miles south of Akarkesh. It was strange the location of the meeting, outside a temple and even more so for a mission. But before she asked, the transmission sign out cut out. Lannery steered her peacemaker ship to the coordinates she had been given. She was entering Titan's atmosphere. She could feel the force more and more as she approached the planet. The coordinates took her to a valley surrounded by mountains where from a distance she could see different hunters and other peacemaker model ships. As she left the ship, three journeyers were waiting to her to escort her to Master Lamy's peacemaker, where the meeting place will be. Entering the master ship, she saw a room similar to hers but customized with a table and eight seats. She identified Master Lamy with his long white hair and visible senescence. Master Dampol and Cather Master Tim Madog, and the other three masters she didn't know who they were. Master Lamy greeted her cordially and motioned her to sit down. Master Dampol greets Lannery after years of not seeing her. She had been Lannery's teacher at the Temple of Zion, Nanilkesh, and they formed a strong bond. In addition, the master was the one who pushed Lannery in the areas of the force in which she was most skilled. Metallurgy, elemental manipulation, and alchemy. Lannery even created a special room on her ship to pursue her experiments in her free time. Weapons master, craftsman, and metallurgy expert, Tim Madog. He created Madog Steel, a very durable and almost unbreakable metal used as the main component in the Jedi's force imbued blade conceived in the forge of Burtap. He was the same one who forged Lannery during steel sword that for Lannery wasn't only a simple weapon. It was an extension of her and now felt cold, solid and sharp 
in the presence of its creator. Lana returned to the master and said, I am the mystery of darkness, in balance with the chaos in harmony, smiling as she quoted the code. The three known masters smiled at her, and the other three remained expressionless. In the background, there was only a grunt from the Wookiee master who was there. One of the three unknown masters introduced himself to Lanary. She tells her name is Xiang. She is a master of the Sith race in the Bodhi Temple. She was a student of Lanary's father and now teaches at the temple with him. Master Xiang also mentions that her parents sent their best wishes and they were aware that they wouldn't be able to see their daughter because of the circumstances they were going through. Lana sensing the tense atmosphere and the seriousness of the situation can guess that it is not an easy time and ask Master Xiang why she is chosen out of all the rangers in the system. Besides, the fact that overstripped to Typhon took her 19 days. Master Xian replies that for this mission, she was the right one. They couldn't think of anyone else who had the experience that Lannery had and she was sure that the mission would interest her. Master Lamy looks at Lannery and told her that this danger not only threatened the Jedi Order, but also the safety of Typhon. The Master explains that for 10,000 years they have studied the Force by developing a society around it and that all the wars and conflicts have been present, for them, the darkness, called Bogan, and the light, called Ashla, were always to be in balance. After a brief silence, he tells Lannery that there is a man with the goal of putting the Titan system out of the reach of the galaxy, a man who was in the search of a hypergate. Lannery finds this hypergate strange. She tells the Master that there is none on Titan, there are just children's stories. Master Lamy accepts that there are stories, but he tells that this man believes there is a hypergate deep in the ruins of Old City on the continent of Tulls. The reports reaching them don't know how he is going to activate the hypergate, but their sources told them that it may be with a device powered with dark matter through arcane means. What is important in this is not the alleged hypergate in the children's stories. It's the dark matter, the most dangerous element known and one that even the Jedi don't attempt to manipulate. Exposing dark matter with normal matter is known to be catastrophic. It could end Titan, create a black hole and even end the system itself. Lannery, with total intrigue, asks how dangerous this threat will be if, in addition to the dark matter, the hypergate were true and if it would work. The sixth teacher, who hadn't spoke during the meeting, answers that the danger to the Jedi will be different, but just as severe. But whether it exists or not is irrelevant. The real threat is with what is required to turn on that supposed device. Master Lamy closes the hatches of the room, and Master Xiang looks at Lanori, telling her that the threat was being planned by her brother, Dale and Brock. The peacemaker was stable, and Lannery fell staggering and in shock she denies it. She tells the master that he died nine years ago. The Sith reminds her that they never found the body, only his clothes. Lannery was full of emotions that overwhelmed her, confused and she couldn't help but remember that her brother always looked up at the stars. Master Lamy adds that they have heard rumors of an organization calling themselves Stargazers. Ask Lanori to find her brother, stop him from doing whatever he's planning, and bring him back to Typhon. Lanori replies to the master that her brother will never return, because before he died, their last days together, she felt a hatred of the Jedi growing in him. Master Xiang explains to her that even though they are siblings, she is a Jedi first and that she must bring her brother back to Typhon and even he refuses, she knows what to do. Furthermore, the Sith emphasize that it's a cover mission. They couldn't send large squads to Dalian because rumors of the Hypergate will reach the populace and panic was the last thing needed now. But besides the fear, 
Dalen's work could inspire people and you don't want people supporting his cause. Master Lamy told her that they trust in her. Everyone in the room stood up and Lanari bowed to everyone and then turned around and left the room. Before reaching the door, she tells Master Xian to send her best regards to her parents and that she will see them soon, the master accepting her request. On her way back to her peacemaker, a riot of emotions played across Lanori's mind. Lanori realized that she wasn't surprised to hear that news about her brother. On the contrary, if everything was true, she was calm and happy because her brother was alive. Now she could do something to change the alien's fate, to repair what in the past she couldn't. Tython Sir moved the baggy pants Lanori always wore, as well as her red scarf acquired in a clothing store in Kalimar that she wore around her neck. To the rhythm of his walk, the silver bracelets on his left hand that were a gift from a Wookiee family in Skagora jingled. At her waist, she carried the scabbard of his sword, a green color made of lizard skin from one of the three moons of Hobri. Her nearly six feet tall and large gray eyes were very particular characteristics of her. As she was on her way to her ship, two children stopped her to give her a small message but the size of her thumb that Master Dampole sent her. Lannery took it and put it away. She turned around to her ship and Iron Holes was waiting for her. Lannery walked up the ramp to her ship and inside, hearing that Dal was alive, relieved the trembling memories that once were there. Near the sea, south of Masara, is the Bodhi Temple, the Temple of the Arts, one of the nine temples of the Jedi Order where Lannery's parents are teachers. Her mother specializes in music, prose, and poetry, while her father is a sculptor and artist. The Jedi Order is constituted by the Jedi Council, and the Council is made up of the masters of the Nine Temples, this denomination being the highest rank. In order to reach that rank, they had to first pass through initiation and enter the Jedi Academy at Padawan Kesh. After reaching enough age, they could become Padawan and could be chosen by a master to continue their studies in other temples and develop more skills and complementing it with field work on colonized planets within the Titan system, the settled worlds under the instruction of their master. Once the Padawan training is completed, the four sensitives must become journeyers, and for this they have to complete the Great Journey which is the journey to each of the nine temples of Titan, spending weeks in them and learning the skills that were practiced there. This journey could last two years and after completing it, the journeyer was promoted to Ranger, where he could be sent to all the planets of the system to fulfill missions or tasks on behalf of the Order. With enough years and with experience and wisdom in the force fully understood, the ranger could acquire the rank of master. Now, two years and nine temples separated Lannery and Dalen from being our Jedi rangers. They finished their Padawan case training and returned to home to say goodbye to their parents. Lannery's mother asked her to accompany her for a walk. On the walk, she communicates her concerns about Dalen and to take care of him. Even though she is only older by two years, the force in her is strong. Lannery's mother sees her youngest son unstable. As she knows of the thoughts and interests in the past that Aileen has always had, and fears for his fate, that it will take him away from the Force. Lannery, after hearing this, tries to reassure her mother. The Force is neither light nor dark, master nor slave, but a balance between extremes, she tells. Soon after, the two siblings set off for the first temple. Their parents watch from afar as they walk away from them along the river. The journey starts northwest of the Masara continent to the other coast where they will travel 500 miles over the Tyrian Ocean in a cloud chaser until they reach the third continent. 
They will continue their way through rocky plains and huge forests and cross the silent desert on foot for three days to reach the first temple, Chigun Kash, the temple of the four skills. After leaving Bodhi, Lannery and Dalen continue walking under the sky of Titan, and she asks her brother if he is excited, because it's not really seen. Dalen replies to her with disinterest that he is. Lannery insists that they will return being other and make their parents proud. Dalen, without giving an answer, only shrugs his shoulders and then only affirms with a yes. Lannery still holds out hope that the bond between Dalen and the Force will be stronger. Lannery's peacemaker passed over Tython's largest continent, Tals. As it exited, the planet's atmospherical sea, the unique 1,000 kilometers canyon that form along the surface of the continent, the rift. To the southwest of the rift is a group of mountains, the largest on Tython, the Tythos Ridge, and on the other side, to the east of the rift, Lannery can see the Temple of Anilkesh, the place where on her great journey she first found peace with the Force, and where also her brother sealed his fate nine years ago. Lannery's ship shuddered from trying to get out of Titan's pool. She took out of her pocket the message that Master Dampol had sent her and turned it on. The Master looked more tense and nervous that she was in the meeting. Master Dampol mentioned to Lannery that, due to the nature of the mission, she wanted to help her by giving her special information. She tells her to go to Kalimar to the city of Roljan, where in Susco Tavern she will meet a twilight named Tresan. Even though he is not a Jedi, he may have valuable information for the mission. The Order didn't want to involve non-council people, but Master Dampol considered it a major emergency, so Tresana seemed available resource. She had already worked alongside the Twi'lek, and although in another circumstance she will have Lanari arrest for his relationship in Chicago, they needed him now. It's well known in the system among the Force Sensitive that many wars don't trust in the Jedi, fear them for their powers and there are some who detest them. The Master advises the Ranger not to trust Rosanna, as he is almost as dangerous as she is and has his own interest. To end the message, the master wishes her well. May the force be with you, she says, and did the message. So much to assimilate and analyze. She had plenty of time until she reached her next destination, Kalimar. It was time to read all the information the order had given her. After checking as usual if his ship wasn't being tracked or followed, she returned to the screen to read all the files on the computer. The Brock brothers' parents had told him that the great journey was to be done at their own pace and by their own means. It wasn't best to make the journey in the comfort of a speeder or at the height of a shire, as this would separate them from truly understanding and living the experience in the place. Dangers will always be present, and they will have to deal with them in their own way. Forty days after their farewell in Bodhi, in almost 1,500 miles northwest, Lannery and Dalen find themselves in Thir in Stark Forest, the place before the Silent Desert. The path is not difficult to interpret, and follows a stream that goes deeper and deeper into the forest. There are very useful trees for travelers that store water in leathery texture sacks. As they enter the trail, the siblings split up to look for food. Dalen goes in search of ground apples, Lannery for a room but. It's here that a group of hawks attack them. These are hooked hawks, endemic to the forest, and when they hunt, they tear at the throat and eyeballs. But their particularity is their mesmerizing song. The hawks emit a fatal noise that disorients their prey and makes them easier to hunt. Lannery tells Dalen that they should go to the stream so that the noise of the water drowns out the song of the hawks. She takes Al's hand, but it's too late. The boy's gaze is totally disoriented. At that moment, a hawk swiftly descends to attack. Lannery gets in the way and throws a punch at it. At that moment, 
she realizes that the clot cut his hand. She grabs her brother's hand and pulls him deeper into the stream. Just as they are again about to descend for the final attack, Lanari with a fist of the force hits all the hawks, many feathers falling from the sky. They recover from the scare and Dalen, without knowing what happened, asks Lanori to get out of there to continue walking deep into the forest. In the distance, they can see the desert with its large dunes. In the silent desert, the brothers could see why they call it that way. The sound was absorbed entirely by some quality of the sand. The deep silence was totally immersive. Lanori tried to speak, but all she could get was the vibration in her chest and mouth but no sound. The first night camping, both are impatient without being able to sleep. A place as mysterious as the desert makes dreams in that absolute silence frightening. Lannery was alert when she sees a shadow pass caused by the light of the campfire. She sees the figure again and realizes that it's a silic lizard. It's a giant creature that possesses six limbs, has spikes, and is capable of absorbing energy from the sand on the ground. Because of how rare they are, these animals are all rarely coveted haunted trophy. Lannery opens its mouth, emitting a soundless scream. The lizard launches towards Lannery and passes over the campfire, opening its mouth and showing its huge teeth. At that moment, a light flies through the night. Terrifying the creature and driving away into the darkness, Lannery stands up, looking around to be ready for any further attacks. Meanwhile, Dal holds his laser blaster still hot from the barrel. Lannery begins to move and give four thrusts trying to hit something, while Dalin looks at his sister and is guided by her movements, preparing for another possible attack. The laser jumps and at that moment Dalin shoots three times. The creature falls close to Lannery, giving her a last kick. After a second time that endangered their lives, the boys embrace and drag the lizard away from the camp to avoid more animals or creatures. The brothers continue walking until on the third day in the distance they could see giant rock spires emerging from the sand marking the location of Chigong Cash. Lannery wasn't sure how far away they were because in addition to the desert still in the sound, its atmosphere caused a visual delirium making the sense of sight very subjective. The following days of trekking to the temple were held. Fatigue was increasingly noticeable factor to the point that communicating by signs was a feat. Their ears needed to hear some noise. It was desperate after days without being able to use them. As illogical as it was, Silence was the worst noise they had ever experienced in their lives. Finally arriving at Chigun Kesh, the temple was located underground in a system of caverns where they could hear normally. From the ground, they see the immense thoyer floating among the needle-shaped stones, when at that moment, several Jedi guards emerged from the caverns, recognizing them as travelers and providing them with water and taking them to the temple. The same temple where the arcane mysterious and enlightened training the four skills will commence and where the fall of Dale and Brock will begin. Iron Hawks, record this in the diary. The Jedi Council asked me to return to Tithe. Missions have always been assigned by messages and information is socially transmitted on secure channels owned by the Order. But now it was the opposite. I was ordered to go personally for instructions. I am a ranger of the order and it's my duty, but after what happened in Skagora, I ended up getting involved in the Wookiee Ground Wars, an unfortunate event and also I had been too far away from Tithe. I had passed by service one of the moons of Ogre. I thought it was something illogical to return. What was my role at this mission? The main reason I was chosen is because it was not a mission. It was the mission for me. I have had time to analyze things and I have remembered many moments with Dalen. I have found my true calling in the force in the Temple of Science in Anil Kesh, and too many doubts had vanished after being able to find myself. I returned to my planet with a great peace of mind and leave Tython again with a great weight on my shoulders. My next stop is Kalimar.
I have to meet a twilight named Tresan. Whatever happens and whatever I face, the Force will always be with me. May the Force be with me. Jedi Ranger, Landry Brock, signing off. Landry's ship calculated the route to Kalimar. In seven days, she will arrive. Throughout the journey, she took the time to meditate, to exercise, rest, and sleep well. Her natural sleep patterns still follow Tython's schedule. Despite years of not being on the planet, she was used to it and didn't see the sense in adapting her ship's schedule to standard time. She also carefully studied the information the Order had provided her with. She looked at the image that had been leaked, they were blurry and meetings could be seen. Besides, she could recognize in the poor quality of the image her brother. She saw him very changed. He looked older than his age. He was taller and thinner and his dusky skin turned darker. Landry had mixed feelings. Happiness to see how her brother looked like because the last image she had of him was nine years ago but with many doubts because she didn't know what was really going on. The ranger had been to Kalimar only two times. Once, she was a mediator in a problem between land developers, fighting over an island in the ocean. The importance to the order was that there was an ancient Greek civilization structure. The second was less peaceful, that time having to stain his war with blood. The peacemaker entered the atmosphere of Kalimar, being escorted by two ships of the planet's guard. She could see in the distance Roljan, a city built on an archipelago. There were five main islands among countless small islands, and bridges were used to connect each territory. Buildings like spires rose into the sky and ships flew around the buildings like birds around trees. Below. Attached to the island itself were buildings and streets that sometimes rose to the surface on bridges. Boats flooded the streets of the city and the huge spires had colored lights that made each of the islands identifiable. The city was so beautiful that the tourism was its main economy source. Lannery arrived in the city at a landing platform located on the top of a building. She took everything she needed, her communicator, her sword, and exit the ship. She entered the huge skyscraper so she could descend into the city. She was escorted and checked by the guards on the platform, all normally and without alerting anyone. She walked through the city with a little concern that she was being followed, bought a drink from a droid and sat down on a bench. At that moment, a tall, hooded figure approached her and greets her. Lannery, without looking him in the eyes, tells him that she's busy drinking her beverage. The person makes her an invitation to have some wine at his house if she wanted a drink. She declines. At that point, the hooded figure tells her that he knows she's a ranger and insists that in his house he has a bottle of 200-year-old wine, the same age as him, ready to drink. Lannery gripping the hilt of his sword threatens him if he doesn't leave. The figure contemptuously continues walking. After finishing her drink, Lannery walks to check out the city. She's amazed at the great diversity of population that was in Vol'jan. Diverse races such as Wookiees, Twi'leks, red-skinned Sith, and Sabraks coexisted among them. Kalimar was the second planet colonized, Big High Tython, and the city was proud of its diversity. Down the street, Lannery could see a group of Dive the Mount chanting one of their strange, haunting ululations. She could also recognize a group of Cathars meditating on an image of their god painted on the ground. In the rhythm of the meditation, she could see the famous Cathar smooth snakes that live subway but were mesmerized by the Cathar chanting. Cloud chasers flew over the city and sometimes landed to pick up passengers. Lannery was like in the city, the huge diversity of stores, business, religions and many families living together in this crowd of people, but she was sure it was the perfect place to be chased without her knowing it. 
she continued on her way to the tavern. Yellow eyes, red skin, and a glass of wine was what Lonnery saw as she entered the tavern. She sensed intelligence and kindness from the twilight. Shrezana smiled and invited her to sit. Lonnery mentioned his unusual red color for a twilight, and he replied with a gentlemanly and formal tone that the weirdest thing was his extra leg. People call him a freak, and that, since he can remember, it had stranded him. Finishing the sentence with a smile drawn on his face, showing his sharp teeth. Lannery tells him that she's not afraid of him. He mentions that he's not trying to intimidate her, looking at the ranger spin with the Jedi star she had on his clothes. Tresana offers her to drink a lock and wine made from deep sea grapes with a special touch of powders from a mine north of Kalimar. Lannery agrees and confidently mentions to him the name of Master Dampo. Tresana reacts to the name and smiles. The ranger, knowing she has the Twi'lek's attention, mentions that she is aware that Master Dampo has contacted him and mentioned the current situation and the reason she is there. With an intimidating voice, Lannery tells him that there is no need to hide any information, and that she knows that the Twi'lek is aware that the person they are looking for is Lannery's brother. Tresana touches her extra leku with her fingers and calmly mentions that he does know what she's talking about, and not specifically about his brother. The Twilight has her rumors about the technical details and blueprints coming from the Greek civilization, the Hypergate and more specifically, what drives that Hypergate. Lannery at that moment thinks about the dark matter that the masters in Titan had told her and also remains in shock at the mention of blueprints of degree. A civilization so ancient and that much of its history was unknown, knowing that most likely her brother had found something that degree had left behind. After some silence and thinking, Tresana tells Lannery that he was Dan Paul's toy. With a more aggressive tone, Tresana showing vulnerability looks at Lannery and tells her that all the promise the master had made to him, money, new identity, will be fulfilled. Lannery, surprised at such an abrupt change, tells him that Master Dampo is an honorable Jedi. After the tense moment passes, Lannery again proceeds with the blueprints and degree, wanting to know more. The Twilight tells her that together they could get more information, but needs her help with one person a Kalimar trader and a stargazer. Lannery was surprised to hear the word stargazer and Tresana instructed Lannery to meet again at sunset. Lannery agreed to such a request and left the tavern with the feeling that she was being watched or followed. Master Terkai welcomes the two brothers. He tells them that the silent desert can be an overwhelming and unsettling place. They enter the cave and Lannery looks at Chigun Cash Temple. At that moment, she thinks it looks more like a city because of how huge it is. When in her mind, she hears Master Terkai tell her not to be distracted and to follow all the instructions. Lannery turns to look at the Master and sees that he didn't open his mouth, and the Master smiles at her. Forced telepathy is not unknown to Lannery, but she is impressed by the ease the Master has. Then, Lannery realizes that Dalin couldn't hear what the master said. They continue walking and Dalin asks a question. The master answered using telepathy, but only Lannery could hear the answer. The master, noticing this, says it loud again. They walk through the cavern and Master Terkai through the mine speaks to Lannery, indicating that when they are on the surface, they wouldn't be able to speak but will be able to communicate by telepathy. He explains that forced telepathy is a talent that some journeyers already have, and those who don't, learn it in Qigong Cash. In addition, the master mentions that he senses in Dalen impatience and lack of desire. Lannery tries to defend her brother by convincing the master that Dalen will make an effort. Master Turka replies that if Dalen gives his best, so will he. 
Over the next few days, the training in Silent Desert tests Lannery by solving difficult tasks and complex problems. For the first time, she feels part of the force, but she also feels a little worried about her brother. She realizes that he is struggling and even in moments of rest, she tries to mentally contact him only to be met with chaotic thoughts, rage and fear. What had Lannery worried after he talked with Tresana were degree. She knew it was a civilization so ancient that the boundary between reality and myth was indistinguishable. Lannery walked through the streets of Roshan and still felt watched or followed by someone or something. She tried to find out if that was really happening, using the reflection of the windows and speeders to watch for any movement. She hid among the beasts of burden that passed by on the street to hide better. Walking down the street, she came across a market between trees. There were small cloud chasers carrying merchandise and people. Lannery ran towards the market and started to move randomly in order to lose her chaser. After a few seconds, she moved to a covered spot to scan the people for any suspects. And bingo. She observed a short individual in a grey robe and mask. Lannery discerned from the silhouette to be an Ogiri, excellent fighters and skilled assassins. She tried to approach the reptilian, but he pulled out his blaster firing blast at the ranger and escaped. Lannery drew her sword and went after him. The Ogiri went running down the stairs and firing into the air to cause panic in the crowd. Lannery was having a hard time keeping up. The ranger used the force to go faster, by forcing her muscles to contract faster and making more blood run through veins. In the distance, Lannery saw the aggressor in a communications column trying to send something. He seemed to care more about that than Lannery herself. She lifted the Nogir with the force and slammed him against the wall, dropping his weapon. She took her sword up and walked towards him. She looked the column where the device was connected. At that moment, she heard a metal noise, and Lannery realized that the reptile was carrying a second weapon. The shots were contained with the metal of his sword. Lifting him up again with the force, she released him against the ground, breaking his leg. Running to his side, Lannery tries to interrogate him when the city militia arrives. The ranger angry because she couldn't get information out of him, thinks of a way to distract the guards. Leaving the Nogiri alone for a few seconds, Lannery hears a child scream and sees that the Nogiri had taken his mask and was carrying some kind of explosive. She put all her strength and all the power she had in the force to protect herself. No sooner had she heard the explosion. With her vision blurred, Lannery stands up and the first things she sees are people around the place. She looks at the place where the Nogir was, and all that could be seen was a totally black spot. He had committed suicide. There was nothing left of him. Lannery looks for the pillar where the device was connected and saw that it had suffered damage, but not serious. She approaches and takes the device that was still connected. It was a camera, as far as she could see. A glass lens with a screen next to it. She began to look inside the device and what she found was a list of stored images, all of which were of her. Lannery had agreed to accompany the guard to the prison. She knew she couldn't cause any more trouble. What had happened earlier with the Nogiri had left people dead and she had to give an explanation to the Kalimar authorities. The cell she was being held in was almost the size of her peacemaker, Captain Lowe's. A tall and burly Sith was in charge of guarding her. She could have escaped without any problems by just lifting her fingers, but if she wanted to stay in the city and meet Tresan again, she had to cooperate. Lorus started a conversation threatening and trying to intimidate Lannery. He needed answers about what happened. Besides, he didn't get along with the Jedi because years ago he had lived with a cocky and boorish Jedi in his own words. 
Loris met Bulk when he was young, and they had too many problems. Coincidentally, Lannery's family knew Bulk well and to clear his name before the Sith, Lannery mentions to him that he was a friend of the family, and that he had died in combat against Shang terrorists and had saved hundreds of lives, the latter leaving Loris thoughtful. Lannery asks him if they know anything more about the Nogiri terrorist. Loris releases Lannery from the cell and they sit down with her. The only thing they found was a claw in the remains of his clothing and they were able to identify him as a cult preacher. To Kalimar's guards, this didn't seem strange, since in the city, because of the great diversity of species, there were hundreds of cults. They confirmed to Lannery that the Nogiri was a stargazer. The ranger, interested to know what Loris knew about the cult, asked him. The captain tells him that not much. The stargazer are a minor sect with that powerful influences and with few members. He has heard that their ideology is based on looking and their ancestors and honoring them as many people are too interested to know where they come from before their ancestors were brought to the Titan system at the beginning of everything. Lannery insists in him to know more about what he knew. She was able to take that opportunity by using his force powers by barely touching the Sith mind, without him noticing. Loris mentions to him that he also knew about Kara. He had heard rumors that she was financing the Stargazers for some reason, as she was too rich from her mining business. With yet another piece of information, Lannery left the police station and got lost in the crowd. At dusk, Thrasan and Lannery gathered in front of Susco's tavern. The streets were pretty much the same, full of people from all over but enjoying the night. Restaurants where people ate, drank, and music played in the street. Walking in the city, Lannery mentions Kara's name to Dre. The twilight looks surprised, moving to his extra leg to hear that name, and trying to answer calmly. Trey tells him that he spoke with her before and will receive them at midnight. But meanwhile, they had to pass the time until the hour arrived, and Tresana tells him that he would take her to a very traditional place in the city. In the depths of one of Roljan's neighborhoods, Lannery found herself inside the pit, a subway tavern that to her surprise the nightlife was indescribable. The mix of culture and great diversity of ideology seems unique to her, more civilized but only by appearance. They went down the stairs to a larger space that looked like a poorly lit cavern. Her nose was filled with a disgusting aroma, sweat and blood combined with other smells, made Lanori look towards the depression in the center of the cavern floor. It was a pit where two fighters were fighting. A human man with extra arms on his hips, in a wookie with lacerated fur and skin, and a collar around his neck with the flashing lights. Lannery thought it was terrible what she saw. Trey tried to soften the moment by saying the fighters were criminals and murderers. The two approached the bar and Lannery heard in a moment more screaming and more cheering. She turned to the pit and saw the bloody Wookiee snarling into the air and the dead human on the ground. A mechanical hand picked up the body and threw it to the far end of the cavern. Lannery understood the reason for the place, but he didn't agree with it. From Chigun Kesh, the two brothers walked to the south coast of Thir. Along the way, they met several journeyers who were making the great journey as well, all sharing stories and advice. Arriving at the coast, their next destination will be Stabkesh Temple. They sat on the cliffs to admire the takeoff of the airships as they flew away over the ocean. The time had come for them, their turn to fly south to the Katosakar continent, also known by Farlands. As within the continent, there is extreme volcanic activity, more specifically, almost 2,000 miles from the northern coast of the continent. Lannery was hopeful that after the bitter times in the silent desert, she and Dal will be on the same page and that her brother will feel more comfortable on the journey. The two siblings, who arrive at the Strafe Plains, scrub land with a very harsh environment. For storms, constant cold, 
in the presence of sinkholes full of magma, with constant danger of them forming suddenly without warning. They are located between the north coast and the ice giant range. The continent of Katosakar bordered with the continent of Tals, and the city of Van Landin provides transportation from Katosakar to Tals, passing the horizon of about 62 miles in distance that includes the Moon Channel and seven scattered islands. Within the mainland of Katosakar, Lanner is alert for different threats. One of them appears in front of them walking through strafe planes, a flame tiger a feline beast with six legs and covered in scales. From the animal's tail, they could see how it spewed white fire and had glowing eyes. Dal pulls out his blaster and takes aim at the animal, shooting at it but missing. Lannery knows that with a force fist, she could push the animal away and be able to attack it, but she knew that Dalen was too proud to see his sister save him again and that after what he experienced in Chig and Cash, Dalen needed that victory to motivate him. So Lannery does nothing. Dalen dodges the animal, shoots it in one leg, making the animal more enraged. Jumping backwards, Dalen aims perfectly at the animal and at that same moment, the animal launches towards the young man. When Dalen sees this, he shoots without hesitation, but the blaster doesn't respond, receiving a claw from the animal and throwing it to the ground. Lannery, seeing this, throws a forward thrust so strong that it hurts the animal badly, running away from the fight. Lannery leaves Dalen, but wounded in the pride, he doesn't accept the help. He reproaches her that he had everything under control and didn't need her help. Lannery tells him that his blaster didn't work and that left him in danger, but Dalin didn't want to listen. After leaving the pit, Lanner and Trent find themselves waiting for an air elevator at the base of a tower to take them to the 200th floor. Tre, with a visible fear of heights, arrives at the top of the tower and it's greeted by Kara. Kara's home was huge and very elegant. The floor of her living room was made of very thin and transparent glass. Despite being a human woman, Lana sees Kara huge. When she passes by her side, she can size the immensity of person. Pale skin and was also bald, so the image of Kara made her look like another species. The woman explained to her two guests that she hasn't left her home for years. Landry told Kara that she already knew what they had come for, and Kara vaguely mentions that yes. About her near murder, she heard about it on the news even though she didn't go out. Information flies. The ranger knowing the attitude Kara was taken, mentions to her that she's an influential person and has a great reach. She doesn't need to pretend or play games with her. Kara smilingly tells her that information is the only universal currency. She can have business and a lot of money, but what she cares about is information and she does whatever it takes to know what she needs to know. Lannery, without hesitation, mentions the stargazers, hoping for some reaction from Kara, but she only limited herself to say that she only knows of their existence. Lannery and Tre start besieging Kara with questions and tell her that they know of her donation supporting a terrorist group, a group intent of murdering people on the street. Kara simply smiles and describes herself as a woman who always wants to push her limits. She tells to her two guests about when she went to the planet of Furious Gate, a planet that is 300 days away. Almost nobody makes that trip because of the amount of time to get there and because there isn't really anything particularly special on the planet. Kara did it because she wanted to go beyond, to break the established limit. She relates that once on the planet's space station, the Fury Station, she sat down to admire the core. She simply looked, and she confesses that she was tempted to go further even though she knew she was going to die. Flannery, after hearing this, reminded her brother, the ideology of looking out. Kara come clean, 
and says that she has all the resources and money and considers herself a philanthropist who funds different groups, a dreamer with money, and if she can help other people with the same dreams, she will. Landry wanted to go further, mentions with technology. She asked Kara if she had heard of it. At the instant the ranger asked her, she felt a soft touch in her mind, as if someone wanted to enter. Kara, without showing any gesture, just said that time was up and they had to leave. She mentioned that they could go to the Temple of the Stargazers in Daivendu to find all the answers they wanted. Lanner refused to leave and confronted Kara, telling her that the Stargazers funded by her could put the sister in danger. After this, Lanner finally broke Kara and recognized something in her. Are you Jedi? She said to Kara, that will explain the subtle mental touch she felt earlier. Smiling bitterly, Kara confirms that at one time she was, not anymore. Picking up a communicator, she calls her security, saying they will stand out by hook or by crook. But before she could finish speaking, Kara falls to the ground. Trey brought a gun so small, the size of a finger, a stun tube. He shot Skara and knocked her unconscious. He told Lannery to hurry and looked for evidence inside the home. Lannery touched his neck and activated a communicator talking to Iron Holes. She instructed the droid to take the ship to the tower. Searching everywhere they could, they tried to find something. Lannery knew that for Kara, information was her most important weapon, the most valuable currency of all. She concentrated on the force to guide her. On one of the walls, Lannery saw a shelf with weapons, swords, maces and armor for ancient civilizations. It was not what she cared about, but the gap behind the door. As if the weapons and armor were the guardians of what was hidden behind, Lannery took her sword and struck the wall, breaking it. Before her, a dark and musty smelling room appeared. She took a lamp she had on her belt and what she observed were books, real paper books, on pedestals covered by glass cases, something Lannery hadn't seen for a long time. Kara's security was about to arrive, and Lannery opening the books, turned the pages, and found what she needed. She put the book away in her jacket, and came out only to find the Kara's security had entered. They were droids, with guns, and ready to fire. Lannery put Trey on his back, and with his sword began to deflect the shots. With the force, she grabbed a droid and threw it against a glass wall shattering and causing a gust of wind in the room. She grabbed Tresana by the waist and jumped out the window, followed by bursts of gunfire. The peacemaker was below waiting for them. The top hatch of the ship opened, letting Lannery and Trey in. On the floor of the ship, both with bated breath and happy to be safe, they take to the skies of Kalimar. Lannery silently pulled out the book she had stolen from Kara and placed it on the ship's control panel. The book was thin, approximately 50 pages long, white leather covered with frayed edges. From the panel, a sphere began to float and landed next to Lannery. It emitted a blue light towards the open book and the symbols in the book began to read. Lannery read the name underneath. Osama El Or, resonating the name in her mind. Beside her bed, in a chair with her arms crossed, Lannery's father before bedtime will tell her the story of Degree and everything I have found of them in the old city by Osama El Or. A member of the Frontiersman 9,000 years ago in his last great adventure. Lannery knew that story about the great secrets of Samael or said lay beneath the old city in Titan. No one wanted to explore more with Osamael, not even his family. As they all said, he was mad. The only one who had faith on him was his sister. There are depths, was the last thing Osamael said to his sister before he went to the old city and never to return. Lannery sitting in front of the control panel knew what she had in her mind. Osama Els Orr's diary.
After camping north of Kato Sakar, from the east the sun rises in Lan Oriental walk to Stadkish, the temple of martial arts. On the way, a white glow could be seen covering the landscape. The breeze was falling in the air and both siblings have an excitement in the air to arrive. Dalen was good at fighting. He had already proved it when he fought with other children in Bodhi, and Lannery hoped he could find his best version and feel happy. Dalen told his sister to stop playing the role of teacher of mother. He didn't need her to do that role and he affirmed that he had already grown into a man. He couldn't expect his sister to always help him or get him out of trouble. After arriving at Stab Kish, both brothers were totally fatigued and out of breath. From the temple, Master Tave arrives and welcomes them. The master tells them that a droid will take them to their rooms so that, during the morning, they can start with the breathing exercise and get used to the high altitude and later they will start the force breathing training. To Dalen, this seems a bit silly. He asks the master why he will need that if they are in the temple of the martial arts. They come to learn how to fight. Lannery, silencing her brother for the disrespect he just did, looks with fear at the master tape, and he, without saying anything, enters the temple with the two brothers following in terror that they will be left outside the temple. Lannery and Dalen cannot believe their eyes. The holograms and stories of the temple didn't do justice to what it was really like. Stapkesh wasn't on the mountain. It was part of the mountain. Buildings could be seen at different heights forming cliffs and a single smooth stone slope was visible. A waterfall fell from the top of the sky, causing icicles on the roofs of the buildings and the spray from the waterfall causing a foggy atmosphere and over the sunlit parts of the city, rainbows could be seen. The presence of the force was felt stronger than anywhere else. It seemed as if it was physically present in the place, as if Ashle and Bogan were tangible. Moreover, a likeness could be felt in the body that made them pull in all directions. Going up to the rooms, on the side of the mountain, they could see the foyer, which was covered by snow. On the table of their chambers, they could find their training tunics. Clearly, that wouldn't cover them from the cold, and Lannery will understand that from the beginning, they are hardening them. In the training arena, the master stands in front of his six students. Lannery, Dalen, two Cathar twins, a Twi'lek, and a Wookiee. Master Tape, with a relaxed posture, tells his students to attack him with everything they have. They all look to each other, in surprise and hesitate to do so. The master again, saying the order, invites Lannery to attack him. She throws a projectile and taped out shit with ease. Lannery prepared a force punch, and the master, with a snap of the fingers, stopped it. Now, with the confidence of seeing the situation, Lannery runs to the left to ram the master, provoking the other five students to infect them with enthusiasm. The Cathar twins take two spike weapons. Dalen grabs a mace, the Whoopi snarls taking two short sticks, and the Twi'lek throws a force punch, but the master, with monstrous agility, throws the twins to the ground, pushes Zal on his back, returns the force punch to the Twi'lek throwing him through the air causing him a bloody nose and dodges the Wookiee. After the master called for another attack, the courier was littered with bodies on the ground, bloody noses, gasping for air and swirling snow. The master moved with the force as if he were himself, apparently entering a trance in performing an advanced form of moving meditation called Alchaka meditations. Rigorous, repetitive, force-driven movements clear the mind and attune the body and force into a unity. You can see how Master Tape never gets punched or a foot never kicks him. He even takes the time to care for his students by throwing the twilight through the air and with the force softening the impact. With his students exhausted, and the master walking among them with his hands behind his back. He taught them that they gave in to the effort and let their movements rule them. They were trying too hard, 
not channeling the force. With each movement, the boy is expending three times as much energy. The shouting in the ground and distract no one. It only took the breath out of their lungs. He stood in the middle of the six boys lying on the floor, and Master Tape taught them the correct way how to breathe. They had to do it with the force and with the air, with both. The students normalized their automatic functions such as breathing, the beating of their heart, the function of their mind, the flow of their blood, to such an extent that they never thought about them. They never saw that these functions were links in a chain. The body was theirs, and just as they had the freedom to choose among many decisions such as what to eat, what to wear, those links were also at their mercy and they could modify them. After the training, it was up to the six students to prepare the food and clean up the place. While doing the chores, Landry noticed that her brother was distant for everyone. Normally, they would make friends and talk to everyone, but not anymore. She also noticed how when Master Tape talked about the force being a friend, a protector, and having a balance in it, Delin showed zero interest in that. The next day in the training yard, with more serenity in the students, with no shouting or groaning in the attacks on the master began. The only sound is the blows deflated by the master, the weapons hitting the ground and the sound of bodies spitting in the air. In a joint attack with the cather, the twins attempt to strike the master's back and in an unguarded moment, Dalen slips and connects a blow to the master's face. Master Tape, smiling at what happened, congratulates Dalen. He recognizes that his breathing has improved and the lessons have been understood. After a pause, he says to Dalen, Now, imagine what you could do if you are willing to let the force in, leaving the courtyard in total silence. At the entrance of the rooms, under a sky full of stars, Lannery and Dal were arguing about what happened in the class. With a mocking tone, she told him that the master let them hit each other. Dal, sick of his sister, tells her to stop treating him like a child and he doesn't need her lessons. He looks up at the sky and says out loud that all this is not for him. All this was never meant for him. Flying in her peacemaker and while Tresana slept, Lannery contacted Master Dampole to inform her about what had happened. Lannery told her everything since she was in the city of Roljan until she jumped from Kara's tower. The most important thing was to inform her that she had found Osama El Or's diary, where he affirmed that under the old city he had found something of the Greek civilization. The master after hearing this was concerned. Also, Lannery tells her that in the end of the diary, Osama El says that he is looking for blueprints. The master confesses to Lannery about her concern and that if the stargazers have blueprints on that great technology, the situation is worse than they thought. Also, Lannery asks her if she knew about Kara, since she found out she was a Jedi. Since the Force was inside her and she couldn't read her or enter her mind through the Force. Sir Dampole mentions to her about the existence of such people. The council called them shunned, like Dagon Luck. There are people who don't find balance in the force and they develop a distaste for it. Before saying goodbye, Lannery asks the master to keep an eye on the old city and mentions to her that their next stop will be the Car Peninsula, where Kara told them about the existence of an old Daivendu temple where she could find the stargazers. Lannery ended the communication with the master and Tresana woke up minutes later. Lannery looks at him and tells him to get ready because they are about to arrive with the stargazers. From her ship, Lannery could see the Car Peninsula. It looked like a diamond hairpin. The peninsula was almost six miles long and rose seven colossal sized towers and ivory colored buildings clustering at the base of each main tower. 
Fred stood behind Lana receipt and they both visualized four sheep, cars police. After Lannery failed to respond to hails, the police were in pursuit mode. The ranger directed her ship into the urban conglomeration and began maneuvering between the buildings. After losing the cops, she headed for the location of the temple and planned to land at the main gate as she knew they had no time to waste on landing authorizations. She landed on the peacemaker, very firstly knocking down the temple door. She entered and noticed that no one was there, but it wasn't abandoned. On the table, they found cold food, beds with clothes and blankets, and in some rooms that had no windows, the candles were still lit, and in one room, Lannery found something that was Dal's. Her brother loved maple fruit. He could eat five or even ten pieces, and when he finished them, he left the remains on the floor in the shape of a circle, and there was. Lannery observing on the floor of the temple in almost closed circle. It was incomplete, and with this she knew that Dal ran away in a hurry. On the wall of the room, there were also holes, nails that could have held maps or blueprints. Lander was angry and desperate that she was so close. Now, Dal could be anywhere and she needed to find some clue that would tell her the stargazer's next move. Inside the room, thoughtful, Lander began to remember how guilty she felt, first for letting her brother die in the past and now for what he became. The choir of the place was interrupted by Tres footsteps and shouting telling Lander to get out of the place. A timer stood in the corner and was about to explode. Rushing to the entrance, they jumped onto the ramp of the peacemaker with an explosion on their backs, throwing them into the interior of the ship. Lannery recovered with an enormous effort and took off the ship. Already in the air, Lannery asked Trey if he had found anything. The twilight shows him a communication unit destroyed, but with one of the memory cells intact that they could check. They handed it to the droid and Iron Holes communicates to Lannery that the card is too damaged and it would take time. The peacemaker went to the limits of the planet's space and Lannery started to analyze if it had received damage. In the meantime, she took out two drinks and gave one to Trey. They started talking about why Trey was helping Lannery to the point of saving her life from explosion. Trey excuses himself that he had no choice but Lannery tells him that he has always had a choice. She also mentions that after living with Trey, Lannery does understand why she was warned that he was dangerous. Trey Thurleku moved and turned a pale pink color. At that moment, Iron Hulks arrives and shows them the communications unit connected to a small screen and several lines of information glowed softly. Safe and sound, Lannery said, smiling. The screen showed 17 stargazers' communications with the planet Nox. Nox was in the third place of the system and it characterized by being an industrial planet, the most polluted of all, to the point that the population has to live in domed cities. Almost 90 of these cities exist on the planet for the sole purpose of refining minerals, being so for almost 500 years. The most important city is Keep Carter because they expanded into the market of manufacturing components for domes. The air of the planet was acid and for the ships that were too long to expose, it had a corrosive effect and for many people including Lannery, Nox was the most dangerous planet in the system. They left the atmosphere of Kalimar and entered the infinite space towards the planet Nox. Stab Cage has been the hardest experience that the two brothers have experienced. Meditating studying, fighting, cooking, living and washing clothes, learn to take care of weapons and even had to learn to plant because under the temple there are caves heated by magma lakes and there they had to take care of the crops, fruits and vegetables that everyone ate in the temple. They had already learned that no one gives things away and to ensure the proper functioning of the temple everyone had to contribute.
Landry was in her chair in the cockpit, studying the communications that were encrypted by military codes in a strange language, and from the little that Iron Holes could extract, one could read, Greenwood Station. Landry knew that if there was one place where the hatred and repudiation of the Jedi was total, it was there. During the Despot War, the station, surrounded by three domes, was damaged by bombing caused by the Jedi. Landry's father served some time in Knox. Tresana adds that Green Station was now totally destroyed. It was repaired in a functional place as it is still the place where the most advanced military technology outside Tython is manufactured. Surprised that Trey was informed of Greenwood Station, Landry felt that Trey was hiding something from her, but since they met, she could never read the Twilight Thoughts as with other beings. They set curse for Knox and both agreed that if the Stargazers were there, it was for the construction of the Great Device. Lannery climbed into the cockpit and plotted the fastest route to Greenwood Station, Knox. As she changed direction to the station, Trey fell almost knocking over the pedestal she had covered. Lannery looked at him angrily and told him not to touch her things. Trey asked about what he almost knocked over and Lannery said it was an experiment she was doing in her free time. At Stop Kish, Master Lammy's room was huge and impressive and the master was sitting in a small wooden chair. Inside the room was Lannery, Dalen, and Master Kinade. The reason for being there was because of many problems with Dalen, and Dale wanted to talk about it. During the talk, there were different views of Dalen's behavior in the last few days inside the temple. It was said that he was distracted and sometimes let himself go by the simplest impulses. Lannery interrupted the talk from time to time to defend his brother while Dalen sat silently with an arrogant attitude waiting for the end of the meeting. Master Lamy, at one point, asked Dalen about the Force and how he feels about it. As if it was a learned speech, Dalen began to speak a monologue and only in the first words, Lannery know that he is lying. After the meeting is over, Master Lamy asks Lannery to stay and the Master tells her that her brother is different. So many years the master have lived and he can see his brother's rejection of the force. Lannery sadly tells him he is wrong. His brother is just frustrated but he tries and he will succeed. Master Lamy tells Lannery that love sometimes isn't enough and all this is doing is driving Dalen further away. Lannery feels a touch in her mind and the master shows her what Dalen was really thinking at the meeting. Deep and dark thoughts. Nox looked rodent and hellish. The sea had a grey color and the atmosphere of the planet was covered by a sickly looking green to yellowish haze. It seemed illogical to her that the station was called Greenwood, if in the spaces where the mist wasn't there and the land could be seen, it was bronze colored. There was no green at all. Lannery was steering the peacemaker on the night side of the planet so that she could get from the opposite side of the station. Landry kept low to avoid enemy radar and flew along a long coastline of one of the planet's continent. She was surprised to see the destruction of the place. It was more impressive than she imagined. The Despot War, more than a decade ago, had been a tragedy and had left many wounds and Landry was in front of one of them. She distinctly remembered when her parents had said their goodbyes before leaving for a war and she also remembered the horrors of Despot Queen Hadiya. The domes of Nox had been bombed by the Jedi and Lannery had seen pictures and had stories but nothing like seeing for herself the destruction. Miles ahead, she saw another ruined city with the dome completely destroyed. She turned the peacemaker and tracked the Ringwood station. In there, she could see movement of ships leaving and entering and what worried Lannery was the possible existence of an army or defense force that at any moment could detect them. Near one of the station's domes, next to a rock, she placed the peacemaker to disguise as much as possible. They put on a mask and Landry wearing a tunic opened the hatch. 
all you could see were silhouettes of buildings in the midst of the planet. Although it was down, the pollution of Nox almost denied the existence of Tidus on the horizon. Behind, the ship's hatch closed and Landry felt the anguish of Bane in one of the most hostile places she had ever been. Once upon a time, Nox was a beautiful place full of life. Huge trees that you couldn't see the end of, and it had been home to a countless of bird and animal species, more than Titan. The greed of Nox's denizens lends to their doom and the only life Landry could see were lizards moving from place to place and on the ground traces of snakes. As she approached the station, the skin of her arms and exposed areas began to burn and itch. She crouched down near a yellowish lake and was impressed by the immensity of the tone. It was approximately 5 miles in diameter and the sensation experienced upon seeing the destroyed dome was one of megalophobia. You lost your balance moving your eyes upwards more than a weapons construction station, it looked like a city. Inside the dome, she found a central tower rising into the sky where it housed the business owners and at the base of the tower stretched factories, transport routes, housing blocks and also many chimneys rows expelling the smoke and the steam. Even though the bomber had been almost 12 years earlier, the debris and destroyed areas were still there. Apparently, the only thing that mattered was keeping the station sealed and keeping it up with pulse cannon and plasma mortars. They keep walking and decide to climb up a spot with debris, construction material and destroy rock that they could use it to get in. They went into the outside of the area in ruins of the dome and the path became more confusing. Collapsed buildings, melted rock and staple pools of the water where Lannery had to help Trey out because he had fallen into one. Up ahead, she could see the entrance to a hallway. With the force, she opened the door. A decontamination gas began to flow out and subsequently the door to the room opened to direct them to another door through a hallway with flashing lights. They removed their mask and stowed them on a loose ceiling panel. Lannery found the atmosphere, the lights spooky. It reminded her the stories she heard about Jedi hunting and Nox, two years after the Despot War. For diplomatic trips to the planet, many rangers falling into traps, killing out of revenge for the destroyed world. Through corridors that smell musty and disuse, they made their way. Later, the air became thicker and now the smell was of something burning. They passed through a large room and began to hear the sound of the city. They left the room to open a door that led to a hill and they could see the immensity of Greenwood Station. They observed a black tower with windows and openings that were launch bays for small craft. The supporting structure of the dome converged at the base of the tower like ribs. Like a snake, there were pathways running back and forth in areas with broken mechanery and old parts piled up. Mobile air purifiers could be sucking in fumes from bonfires and pipes being sent outside. The factories roared and churned, you could see that the manufacture of military vehicles and armaments was running smoothly. Even though there was no visible wars, there was always a demand for military hardware. Some barons of Chicago, Kalimar or Skagora had the need to be armed at all times. After seeing the vastness of the city, Lannery thought of a new problem. It was almost 40 square kilometers of industrial buildings, housing, warehouses, ports, and she had to find Dal or the Stargazers. During the trip to the station, Landry was insisting to Trey to tell her the truth about him and the Syringer station, since he gave important clues and that implying that he had a pass there. With the 40 square kilometer to cover, Landry had no choice but to pressure Trey to help. They had a lot to cover and little time. Shyly and sadly, Tresana tells Lannery that he had indeed been to Nox before and knew a person who could help find clues, but he was too nasty and a scum of a person. Almost two weeks had passed at Stab Kish, and there were times when Dalian was taken away from the rest to give him private lessons. When he returned, 
She will ask him what he was doing, and he will only give vague and mean precise answers. There were times when Lannery, from the distance, would try to connect mentally with her brother, but he would refuse. He already knew how to control it. On the last day at the temple, as they traditionally do, they were taken to the Grand Hall, a structure built deep in the mountain, cold and lit by torches. It is said that the master, Vordana, in that hall killed 30 sand assassins. Today, over 200 years old, the wind whistles like swords in battle, and the sand moves in a special way. Master Kinade and Master Tave are standing in silence. The six students are waiting in line, and at the end, Master Lamy enters the room. In total silence, Master Lamy shouts and orders them to fight. At that moment, the two Cather and the Wookiee with the Twi'lek begin to fight as if it were a final test. Meanwhile, Lannery with a little shyness turns to Sidol. His brother with fury in his eyes attacks Lannery. At that moment, a fight starts between the two, where Lannery tries to restrain herself because of the feeling she has for Dalen, and he attacks with everything he has. Dalen's Alchaka moves are bad, and for Lannery, he could be too easy opponent, but she limits herself not to hurt him. This is perceived by the three masters. After some time fighting, Master Lamy stops everything, the four students congratulating and hugging each other, while Dalin turned his back to Lannery. The next day, Lannery and Dal start a journey to Anil Kesh, on the Tal's continent. More than a 600 miles to the east, they will be starting the journey to the Temple of the Science. To cross the Tales, they will have to pass through the Moon Islands and face a long trek through the wilderness. At Ringu the station, Trey and Lannery stepped out onto the street. Tresana seemed like a different person. He looked like Dampol had described him. Dangerous. His manner, his bearing, his interaction with the world changed. Merchants tried to sell their products in the streets. Bars advertising drinks she had never seen or heard of. Large trains coming and going with raw materials and the ground rumbling with machinery were some of the things Landry could witness. The law didn't exist in the place. Ringwood Station was a corporate lead place and security wasn't an essential thing there. A group of people gathered around a dead body in a pool of blood. Apparently, someone had been run over by a train. Curiosity gathered the people, but no one did anything. The only security in the place was for the corporate people in the Searcher Tower. The two headed to the grey house in tower. That was the place of a partner to knew. They climbed the tower stairs and knocked on the door. After a few seconds with no answer, Lannery kicks it open, knocking down a Savrak on the other side. Tresan introduced her to Dom, a business contact. Lannery puts her sword to the Savrak's neck and Trey, standing next to her, asks her for Max Hagan's location. After a few seconds of trying to get up and falling, Dom tells them that Max Hagan is in District 6, a merchant selling imported water. After getting what they wanted, Tread told Lannery to kill Dom because he had already seen him and it was a danger to let him go free. Lannery didn't want to do it. She didn't like to kill without being necessary and took another option. She approached Dom and concentrated. She felt the force gathering inside her. Suspended between Ashla and Bogan perfectly balanced, from the ground she lifted four dust particles that became an extension of her. To each of the particles she gave a touch of the force and slowly pushed them through Dom's eyes. Lannery heard Dom's screams. With her eyes closed, concentrating on her task, she moved the particles the eye and the sensation of touch was intense in her. Lannery was taking a deep breath, tempted to go completely to Bogan's eye, the dark one, but she knew she had to be in balance. Seconds later, Lannery left the room with Tresana. That was her talent, the alchemy of flesh. The ranger had cauterized Dom's memory for a while, and he would even remember her name. Now. It was time to go to District 6.
On their way to Anil Kish, days after traveling, they are already on the coast from where they can see the first of the seven islands of the moon. It was 62 miles that separate them from the tallest continent, and that distance seems so short compared to the distance that was existing between the two brothers, despite living all day together. The brothers arrived at the port of Van Landing, where they would take their transport to Tals. They spent the night in a hut by the water's edge, on the wooden beams that support the roof are carved dozens of names, from travelers of past years who stayed here before. Lannery gleefully looks up and runs her finger over each name. Lannery and Tresana were on their way to District 6. The streets were a mix of large factory buildings, warehouses and open-air parks. Lannery found it amazing how people could live in such a place, steam generating factories and sooty buildings, but she knew many had no choice. People were born and died in Knox, their lives traced from beginning to end. Most earned just enough to survive and leaving the planet would cost more than most could save in a lifetime. No doubt the corporations like it that way. During the tour of the streets, Tresana would relate to her how dangerous Max Hagen was, a monster with a brain. Some time ago, the family of House Volk in Chicago had to put information from Max Hagen, which they then refused to pay for. Max Hagen didn't hesitate to kill three members of the family. He subsequently conspired with the information he gave the family and Max Hagen ended up with the entire Volk family network in Knox. Minutes later, they arrived at a huge square with smells of food combined with smells of factory. Max Hagen was easy to find, a rough-skinned, wrinkled human man with little white hair standing behind a stall, selling only water with a sign boasting that the best water in the galaxy imported from Kalima. He got a great humor, making all the people around him laugh. No doubt it was him because he casually being watched by Tunogiri, three places away from Max Hagen was. Also, one woman, 100 meters away in the building located above the place, with a sniper blaster standing guard. They approached Max Hagen and without hesitation, he greeted Tresana by name. Despite never having met in person, Max Hagen always knew who he did business with. Tresana surprised to see that he knew of his existence and also that he knew what he looked like physically. Lannery, with one hand on the sword, covered by the rope, tries to enter Max Hagen's mind, but he notices and he whispers, Jedi, sensing Lannery. Max Hagen tells Lannery that there are many Jedi scenes in these parts. Alarmed at having been discovered, Lannery tries to enter his mind, but it's impossible. He must have a high-end military technology implanted in his school that prevents it. Max Hagen explained that in places like Knox, such protection was necessary. With a smile on his face, he invited them to eat and talk business. Through three doors and then down a staircase hidden behind a locked wall panel, they arrived in an impressive room. With a calm tone, Max Hagen told Tresana if he was coming again for mercenaries. Lannery gave him no importance and asked him about the stargazers. Max Hagen pretend not to know anything and then the Jedi tells him that it's his brother she is looking for. Surprised by the information and satisfied with what he heard, Max Hagen agreed to do business but all for a price. Tresana offered half a million credits, a generous offer that Max Hagen without hesitation will accept but there is a problem. The network of information so valuable that he had formed on the planet will be in danger if it became known that Max Hagen helped the Jedi. Tre and Lannery swore they wouldn't say anything, and Max Hagen asked her the name of who she was looking for. Lannery said the name of his brother. Thoughtfully, Max Hagen accepts the offer. He tells them that at midnight they will meet again, and if Dalen is on the planet, he will know by then. Lannery stares at Max Hagen and shivers at the confidence he has, something dark and repulsive about him. It had only happened to her once before, in Bogan with Dale and Locke, once when she saw him. As they walk away, 
Trey Kim Owens to Lannery and told her that even being born in Kalimar and the welcome diversity that exists, his third leg made him a monster. Teasing and rejection was what he always received. Tresana made his name with violence, money, and secrets. His first murder was at the age of 17, and from then on he went into crime. Over the years, Trey accumulated wealth, power, and status and formed his own criminal organization, moving his operations to Chicago. Tresana says that in that place everything is very different. The real crime lords look at them as something insignificant. Tre confesses that he expanded too fast, went too far, and that caused Chicago to take notice of him. They killed all his lieutenants, they left no one behind, and in Tresana, they saw an opportunity. They gave him the option to work for them, making money by keeping secrets. Secrets that could not even be greeted on holos or be trusted to a droid. Tresana transported those secrets for them, and if anything happened, he simply died. The Twilight tells Lannery that on one of his journeys, he met Master Dampol, and she promised to help him. She told him that in the future, she will give him a new home, new identity, a new face, a new life. Lannery realized what Dampol had done. That was the reason she couldn't read Trey. A fierce gift make him impenetrable for my reading to protect him. With a lost expression, Tresana, in a ton of hope, tells her that he trusts the master to help him to have his life back. Lannery wakes up, looks at Delgan's face, where most of his face is in shadow. They are camping a day away from Anil Kesh. Lannery hears sounds in the dark. She feels scared. Delian, seeing his frightening sister, tells her that he would take care of her. Lannery looks strangely at her brother. He's behaving strangely. In a deep voice, Delian says, I am the cousin. And it scares Lannery more. Delian looks at his sister and claims that he has death still waiting to be explored and places to go. Places where a Jedi, like her, wouldn't be able to reach. He ends by telling her sister that his journey will be over soon. The next day, they were near Anil Kesh, a massive and impressive structure to behold. The temple was located on the side of a cliff called the Chasm. The shape of the temple reminds Lannery of an insect. The thoyer floats around the temple in a constant motion, sometimes near, sometimes far, as if at the mercy of the sea of the force. Beneath the temple lies the chasm, a seemingly bottomless and utterly mysterious pit, and within, the storms of the force are released. One of the main objectives of Anil Kesh is the investigation of the chasm. The master of the temple, Huang Zhang, always said that they will reach the bottom of the wall. Greenwood Station never slept. They approached Max Hagen's hall and saw him closing the broken shutters of the place, saying goodbye to some customers with a smile always on his face. Max Hagen welcomed them, led them to the back of his hall. They passed a different hallway than the first time and arrived at a new place, a tavern. Max Hagen pointed to a corner table while he went for drinks. Lannery was scanning the whole place to be on the lookout for any threats. Max Hagen arrived with drinks at the table and Lannery asked him if he knew about her brother. The daytime water sailor just said a simple yes. Lannery asked him if he was still in Knox. Max Hagen told him strictly no, still with a smile on his face. The Jedi found that answer off and demanded he explain. Max Hagen tells Lannery that she is still very young and over the years you can experience and information that in this case, this information is only known to the older Jedi. Max Hagen tells her that her brother is in a place where sometimes even receives orders from the Jedi. It's called Pan Deep. It's a laboratory that is located in the central base of the Great Tower. 
It has the advantage of being close enough to the surface to benefit from the life support system and deep enough to survive the Jedi bombardments. It's totally secret enough to be somewhere else. Lannery didn't know Pandip. Max Hagen with a mocking laugh tells her that's the choke of secrets, not knowing they exist. He also tells Lannery that it's not coincidence that the domes around the Greenwood station were totally wrecked. Its people fried and crushed in the main Greenwood dome only suffered a flesh wound, pointing Max Hagen up in the direction of the broken dome that was fixed. Pandeep was a place for highly advanced military technology. Sometimes the technology went further that Max Hagen even bothered to understand. Technology that anyone with enough money to pay could acquire and that the Jedi at any time will still need. Lannery asked if her brother was still there, Max Hagen claiming he arrived two days ago. Lannery perceived two people at the bar. They were at looking at the table, a Savrak and a Wookiee. Also, three Nogiri laughing in a very fake manner on the wall behind them, all Max Hagen's men. Lannery placed his hands on the table and threatened him. She told Max Hagen that the Jedi are not to be fooled with, they have paid for information, and despite being a disgusting person, business is business. Max Hagen, still with a smile on his face, staring at Lannery, took a memory capsule and handed it to her. Lannery left the place hoping she didn't have to cause a bloodbath. On the street, she accessed from her crest the Peacemaker's computer. The construction plans from Greenwood Station went transmitted to Lannery. The Jedi examined the plants, artificial formations deep underground, transport routes, huge tunnels dug, but there was no sign of location Max Hagen had told them about. Lannery and Trey made their way through the first subway level. Down an old metal spiral staircase with glowing rods sliding their way. Then they came to a long tunnel leading to the tower. They walked in the tunnel opened up in the dugout cavern. There was a huge plague with a sloping floor from all sides to a sinkhole in the center. It stank rancid and just opened your mouth made you puke. The station map no longer gave an indication of a path ahead. Pandip had to be somewhere. She tapped Trey on the shoulder and pointed to a huge cavern with a glow stick indicating a space. They will enter through there. They walked and saw a small hallway. Lannery concentrated on the force trying to send some entrance or source of power that will give them a clue. She found a possible sign and they continued walking down the hallway. They came across a tunnel that it wasn't on the designs. They turned on a glow stick. Up ahead there was a glow and she could touch man's mind. She took Tres' arm and walked over to tell him they were guards. Lannery drew his sword and threw his blaster. She touched the man's mind again, but it had all been a bluff. She had never contacted the mind. Blaster shots rang out and she was able to touch the real mind. Lannery swung her sword, repelling the shots. The man was wearing a robe and multiple silhouettes emerged behind him. In the darkness, it began to blow blaster shots flying everywhere. Lannery knew she couldn't miss an opportunity to be so close to her brother and told Tread to stay behind her. With the force, she threw the stargazers and in the darkness all she could hear was screams. Lannery was forcing her way through with the force in her sword, slashing Nogiris and any silhouette that came her way. Tre was helping from behind with blaster shots. They came along a tunnel, through a door, up some stairs, and suddenly and ahead began a metal hallway. She scratched through another door and came to her room was large with smooth walls and its clean lines. The ceiling and the floor were white, like nothing they had ever seen before in Knox. There was a central table with an object wrapped in a sheet and the instruments and components scattered around the table. And around the room were several gabinets on wheels. In one corner were six Selkath in white coats in terror and standing beside the table, Dalen. Surprised to see his sister, Dalen called her name. He walked over to Lannery, who was in shock. Dal looked as if he was happy to see her and Trey screamed, something hit Lannery's head, seeing the floor approaching her and then total darkness.
Lannery is in Anilkesh. The first days there were strange. All the new travelers had to go through a process of adaptation to the influence of the disturbing view of the abbeys below the temple. And for that, they meditated, they were given talks, and kept in windowless rooms to avoid curious glances to the bottom of the well. Dalen, as they arrive, speaks very little, but transmits a sense of peace to be there. He feels happy. Each of his three gigantic support legs houses a complex group of living quarters, with structures designed to give the supports as much strength as possible. Inside the legs, our cloud chaser size shocks absorbers to soak up the incredible pressures exerted on the temple by the frequent and violent storms originating from the chasm, and also banging inside the legs, you can feel them being shaken by the wind. Inside the temple, our large laboratories, teaching rooms, private studios for the temple masters, libraries, holy suites, and meditation chambers. Dalen tells Lannery that he will go outside to see the scenery. Lannery gets dizzy just thinking that, and Dals heads down a hallway that leads him to a heavy metal door. He turns the door handle and it opens. The rush of air is shocking, mixed with warm raindrops. Lannery feels a moment of panic and steps out with her brother. Above, he raises one of the three large curved arms of the temple. They act as counterweights for the legs and also as transmitters and receivers, gathering atmospheric charge to power Anil Kesh's experiments and sending messages from the Temple Masters to other Jedi of Titan and beyond. A rain covered the entire. Lannery can see through the mist of the pouring rain the frequent cinders of force lightning, bursting in the darkness and illuminating nothing. Captivated by the moment, Lannery feels a hand touch her shoulder. It was Master Dampole, asking her to go inside and speak. Lannery with blurred vision, she could barely open her eyes. Her head felt hot and wet. A voice boomed in his head saying that he never thought that the one they will send on the mission will be her. Lannery tried to open her eyes and looked up at her brother. Dalen knelt down to where his sister was and she whispered to him that he had grown up, causing Dalen to smile. Her brother looked older than his age. His hair was thin and gray, with a scar on his left cheek. Lannery still in pain, trying to enter Dalen's mind but couldn't. She felt nothing of the force within him. No light, no darkness. No Ashla, no Bogan. But he had an incredible strength that she had begun to recognize nine years before. Dalen began to speak to Lannery and pointing to the corner of the room. Trey was beaded and bleeding from a wound of his forehead. In addition to the scientist, there were three other people in the room wearing the same tunic as Dal. In the distance, an explosion was heard. Dalen took the object wrapped in the sheet. It has the size of Noguri's head in a shape that looked completely spherical. Dalen sees it and says that it was almost ready. He looks at Lannery and asks her if she knows what it is. Lannery answered him yes. As if it was the most precious thing to him, Dalian's gaze was lost at the sight of the object, like a madman. A sudden change came over him and he looked at the group of scientists in the corner with hatred and fury. One of the scientists with fear explained to him that they had worked very hard on his order, one of the most perfect creations that had ever worked on. With a smile on his face, Dalen nodded to the stargazers and they understood the signal. The three opened fire on the scientist, leaving Lannery speechless at such a scene. She saw fire consume the scientist's robes and heard screams of pain, the last sound a living thing will make in its life. Lannery tried to reach her sword, but it was gone. Dalen, with her eyes on Lannery, told her that he hoped she understood. He blamed the Force for having her sister bound, and he blamed Lannery for letting herself be blinded by the Force and serving as a slave to it. Dalen yells at Lannery that they had a place in the universe that was stolen by the Thoyer when they were brought into the system. Lannery tells him that the great technology and dark matter is beyond his knowledge. Even the Pandip scientist says that that stuff is on the edge of known science, and the boundaries can be broken. 
Flannery heard another explosion in the distance and asked her brother about it. He explains that apparently the neighboring city of Ringwood Station, Null Tander, hates the Jedi because of what happened with the bombs. Many survivors of that day lived there and apparently someone told them about the connections between Pandip and the Jedi. In addition, Dalen sent a stargazer to kill several corporate presidents with a Jedi sword. Lannery wondered which sword and remembered Kara. Dalen took his things and left the room with the other stargazers. Lannery from his boot pulled out a tracker and tried with the force to place it on Dal, and as he was leaving, she succeeded. One of the stargazers stayed with Lannery and Trey. He had a blank stare with no visible emotion on his face. Explosions in the distance rumbled through the room. With Trey unconscious, Lanner approached him, but the guard was watching for any movement they made. Lanner began to move closer to Trey, and without being able to perceive before, a deafening explosion launched Lanner through the air. A bomb vest was what the stargazer had. Pain all over her body and bleeding wounds was how Trey tried to lift Lanner off the ground. They got to their feet and stumbled over all the destroyed material in the room. The explosion had blocked the exit through the torn metal and a large crack in the room was made where fluid was constantly leaking out. Another explosion outside the room occurred opening a gap in one of the walls. Lannery tried to look for her sword but she had lost it and regretted it. They came out into a long hallway that led to a cavern which had an ascending tunnel inside. To Lannery it seemed incredible what her brother had caused, to leave no trace of him. He started a war between domes of the same planet, ending hundreds of lives for his goal. They continued walking without knowing where they were going. Blood covered Lannery's eyes, and even her ears were bleeding, but she couldn't stop. Their route took them upwards. They had emerged just above the base of the central tower, overlooking the west side of the Ringwood station. The sounds, sights, and chaos of war were almost overwhelming. Master Tampol angrily lifts Lannery from her bed. She tells her that her brother has flown to the abyss of Rue, putting lives in danger. He hasn't left because they were able to intercept him in time. She leaves the temple with Master Tampol, receiving Master Guang Zhang from a cloud chaser. He reports that everyone is fine. Dalen doesn't want to talk but he's healthy and the others who accompanied him only feel sick for having spent some time in the place but nothing serious. Lannery asks about what will happen to her brother. Master Tampol tells her that he will be escorted out of Anil Kesh and from there whatever he wants. Lannery is concerned to hear that because they will be banishing her brother. Then the master tells her that they must go inside and Lannery refuses. She will wait for her brother. Lannery hadn't seen Dal for four days because she went on an excursion with the master Guan Zhang. She realized that she missed him already and more with what happened. Dal arrived in a cloud chaser and together with the others escorted them inside the temple. Lannery went behind him and approached her brother. She saw his expression and realized that something has changed. Very serious. His skin was born and his eyes were red and swollen. Dalian looks at his sister and says goodbye to her and Lannery doesn't understand what's going on. A journeyer named Scott Jun approaches him to arrest him. He tries to grab Dalian's hand and at that moment he hits him in the face. Jun falls to the ground and Dalian kicks him. Then from his tunic he takes a quad blaster and shoots the journeyer. Lannery shocked of what happened screams to her brother. Dalian runs out on a platform. Lannery chases after her brother. She runs against a wall of the temple, crosses its curved roof, follows his distant shadow through the growing downpour until she slips through one of the huge legs onto dry land. Tresana and Lannery stand on a balcony of the center tower for a moment to appreciate the disaster of attack provoked by Dalian and its impressive. The whole place was filled with screams, explosions, weapon being set off. 
At one of the entrances in the distance, Landry could see a battle droids firing laser cannons into the city. Plus, a plasma cannon started hitting the ground near the base of the column, and each impact was huge and shook the city. Trey grabs Landry and yells at her that they have to leave. From the balcony, Landry and Trey jumped off, and the four was able to break the fall. On the street, many people were running out in all directions. Outside the dome, they could see lights and hear droid gun fire, and ground troops fire at each other. Landry felt a deep vibration that shook the buildings. Glass shattered and debris fell all around her as the weaker buildings began to collapse. Landry picked up her communicator and ordered Iron Hose to prepare the ship and also sent him the information about the tracker she placed on Dalian. A plasma bomb had broken through the defenses of Greenwood Station and had snuck in very close to the central tower, exploding knocking down and incinerating everything in the path. The destruction was so enormous and so far away that it seemed to be happening in slow motion. Lanor and Trey held each other up between the two of them. They ran towards an exit. Before opening the door to the outside, they regretted not having the mask they started with. But in Lanor's ship, she had medicine for skin burns and for any side effects on the lungs. Lanor from the front opened the door and they rushed out to the ship. Within the minutes, she could feel her skin burning, and in her throat and mouth, she could taste the acid in the atmosphere. They arrived at the ship with red eyes and tears unable to see well. Blur breathing and coughing, they started the engine. Landry tried to do it fast because she knew Dalin was leaving orbit and could lose the tracker signal. They began to fly off the planet. She looked down at the destruction of Ringwood Station. She was saddened by the scene and also questioned if this event wouldn't leave seeds of hatred for the new future. Lannery followed her brother for days. After he murdered Scott June, she was afraid that Master Dumple thought she was an accomplice in her runoff with Dalen. Her brother's trail was sometimes poorly marked, but she could not lose him. The path took her south to the continent of Tulls, without weapons or supplies. As she walked, she understood why she had been told that the landscapes were bizarre and strange. Hills descending into endless plains, and Lanor experienced extreme winds as she walked. Winds that always cut through the vegetation, extreme gusts caused Lannery to walk with difficulty, and some other gusts knocked her to the ground and moved the vegetation, causing the sharp points to cut Lannery's skin. She stayed on the ground until the strong wind enters hours later, almost at dusk. The landscape was unique. The frost caused by the strong winds covered the grass, hardening and forming an endless landscape of glittering jewels. Lannery thought that the place where Dalen was headed was the old city, where the true titans lived. Dalen had long since formed a romantic vision of the city because of the unknown of the place in the unexplored caverns and canals. The old city is located in the Red Desert, south of Tals, a place not visited by anyone but explorers. Lannery leaves the plains to enter the first dunes of the desert. Lannery wakes up shivering. She has slept for a short time in hurries to pick up Dal's trail. Trying to remember maps and legends of the Red Desert, she calculates that the old city could be 50 miles further south. And although she has lost Dal's physical trail, she is now certain that the ruins are her destination. She continues walking for hours until she finds the old city. Along the way, she puts into practice the survival tactics her parents had taught her as a child and starts feeding on bugs and whatever she can find along the way. At the nightfall, she sees the first construction, a collapsed wall at the base of a hill, covered by sand. She claims the dune, and to the west, she sees the sun setting behind the old city. The peacemaker followed Dal to the first planet in the system, Sunspot. They pass to the orbit of Maltorra, the second planet going in the opposite direction of Sunspot and Lannery knew exactly why he was going to the first planet in the system. The device 
needed to be charged as she heard on pan deep from what the saints told Dal. And on sunspot, the mines were deep and incredibly dangerous, and there were exotic items that could be used as fuel or weapons. Lannery contacts Master Dampole to tell her everything that happened, but seeing by her face, she knows that the Master has knowledge of what happened in Knox. Lannery informs her where she's going. The Master is worried because when Sunspot and Maltora get close, magnetic interferences happen because of the proximity of the orbits and cause space storms, and in general, any space travel in the region becomes impossible. Dampole demands her to accomplish the mission no matter what. The price of failure is very high and orders her to be strong. After a few seconds in silence with a sweeter voice, the master tells Lannery to be careful and she ends the transmission with, May the force be with you. Lannery found herself staring at the muted screen, analyzing, sad and scared, and strangely comforted by Tress present sitting next to her. The only thing that sounded in the silence of the cockpit were the buttons and the sound of the scanners. Trey turned the co-pilot's chair around and threw up on the floor. Apologizing to Lannery, he told her he felt sick. Lannery gave him water and a napkin and told him it was probably caused by Knox. The short time they were exposed could have caused that. Five million miles away from Dalen's ship, they spent the next few days on the Peacemaker. Trey wasn't getting worse, but he wasn't getting better either. He wasn't eating and could only drink water. Taking advantage of the time, Landry started reading about Sunspot and remembered that in the environment it was worse than Nox. Sunspot, the first planet in the system, closest to Tithus, on its surface was in a constant turmoil, with volcanoes and earthquakes changing its landscape almost daily. Its most populated areas were mainly at the poles. And it was here that the scattered mining communities were located. It was perhaps the harshest inhabited environment in the Titan system, although the rewards for miners were enormous. It's also the only planet that rotates in the opposite direction or like the other ten. For the Titan system, Sunspot was considered by all to be dead planet. Civilizations were found at the poles of the planet, but people only went for a short period of time to work, and if they survived, they vowed never to return. Sunspot was a mere resource, not at home. Arriving at the south pole of the planet, the violence of its surface was evident. A steady glow shone from a fine network of volcanic ridges and magma lakes and rivers and shadows of noxious continent-sized gas clouds covered the light, turning it a pinkish hue. Lannery took all her things, to blasters and took from a closet her old training sword, the one she used before Tim Maddox gave her the sword she used all her life. The ship entered the planet's atmosphere swinging. Warning sounds blared in the cockpit and Lannery downloaded terrain information. She had seen that Alien had reached a mining area called Randan's Folly. According to Lannery's records, that mine produced plutonium and maronium to make weapons and ship propellants. She landed her ship on the planet's surface and needed to act as quickly as possible because Maltorra and Sunspot were closing. Lannery left dress sick in the ship and went out to investigate. She could see the area, a mine that was at the base of hillside of detached rocks and buildings surrounded and constructed almost entirely of rock and held together by chains. Three heavily armored land cruisers were parked near the walls of the buildings. There were also three landing pads and thanks to the tracker, she could tell that Dalen's ship was there. Furthermore, she understood why she wasn't going to be able to shoot it down in a battle in space. His ship was a Death Blaster, sister ship to the Death Stalkers, being a ship large enough to carry a payload of bombs, equipment or passengers. Many such ships had been destroyed in the Despot War. She approached the ship, sensing two stargazers. Lannery couldn't risk it and prepared to kill. She approached the Itachi woman and when what caught severed her head from her body, cutting off the characteristic horns she had. She went to the other stargazer and with his sword pierced her chest. She went into the mine after. She saw the central building of the mine and approached it to see if anyone was there. A volcano in the distance erupted making a sound. 
Lannery grabbed her sword in case she needed. She walked towards the descending elevator. At first glance, the mind reminded her of the tunnels under the center tower of Greenwich Station. Along the narrow corridor, which led in two directions, there were occasional flickering lights. Without realizing it, a blast of hot air caused by the change in temperature threw her to the ground, knocking her breath away. As she tried to stand up, she heard a rock falling on her head. Trying with all her might to use a force to stop it without success, she felt the pain and then darkness. After Lannery overcame some wild animals on her way down the Red Desert Dune, she is amazed to see the city and it's overcome with a feeling of shock and astonishment as she remembers all the history the place has. She follows Dal's trail, the only human's footprints visible in the sand. When his trail disappears for a while, she continues anyway, guided by the instinct. The ruins are so ancient that most have long since been buried or worn away. Plus, there are the tips of pyramids, the crevices of fallen walls, or the deep recesses of openings in the ground. This pit seems to exhale the strange energy she feels since she has been in the place, an energy divorced from the force. And it is to one of these wells that Dal's footprints lead, Lannery descends. Using the glow stick so she can see, she observes the place. It's too strange and gives her a sense of territory from another galaxy. The places she has been on Titan all share one characteristic. They are made for the beings that inhabit the planet now. These ruins are different. Lannery descends several levels that at the end she realizes are huge steps, as if built for giants. She advances through a tall, wide hallway and the air she breathes feels old. Dal's footprints drag her forward, sunk into the dust. They are far apart and deep. She keeps walking, and as she descends another giant staircase, she thinks she still hears her brother's name in the darkness. Of the Greek civilization, it is said that they possessed amazing arcane technologies that allowed them to travel among the stars, that they were a nomadic species, exploring the galaxy for unknown purposes. Lannery loses track of time in the place. She can say exactly how long she has been there. She keeps walking between corridors with devastated structures, Water running over the walls in the smaller tunnels that offer tantalizing and terrifying possibilities, but Lannery doesn't stray from her path. A metal bridge crosses a deep, dark graphene, from whose depths a warm breath emanates. The bridge sounds as she crosses. Ahead is another large cavern in which tier levers look like sitting areas, and the central dais holds the remains of several override mechanical objects. As she looked off into the distance, Lannery heard voices, urgent and angry, making no effort to conceal themselves. She felt warm in her body as she was thrown to the ground. She rolled onto her side, feeling around for injuries. She didn't see who it was or what it was that threw her. Lannery opened her eyes and sat up hugging her knees to her chest. Several humans, dressed in protective clothing and visor helmets, were visiting themselves around a mining equipment. Dal was close behind her, blaster in hand, pointing in her direction, and he was accompanied by the stargazers. Dalian tells her that she's hard to kill. Lannery yells at him to shoot her to get it finished now. Dalian prefers not to. With his help, he points to a place in the distance Lannery turns. She sees stargazers near the device that was on the ground. The device was very simple a round metal shell, several connecting ports around its circumference. Around, miners were checking on screens to see how the machinery was working. Lannery, knowing that her chances are low, tries to awaken something inside Dalen, telling him to kill her, if he really was totally devoted to the cause. She even calls him brother again, but Dalen shows no emotion. Even though Lannery was trying to incite him to act, his brother was only limited to a smile. The machinery in front vibrated slightly and then went still. A square metal box came out of a hole in the floor of the mine, a maronium cube. 
Dalen gave directions to some stargazers and they lifted the cube closer to the device. The insertion was simple. The Maronium glowed softly as they inserted into the DAO's device, closed the panel and stepped back. The device began to spin, rose and hovered in the air, spinning faster and faster until it seemed to disappear from sight, return and vanish again. Lannery felt suddenly sick, dropped to her knees and began to vomit. For an instant, the force was absent from that mine and its place was only the artifact, still spinning and fading. She looked around and the miners were holding their hands, while Dal and the stargazers were gleeful. Dalen had an astonished look on his face, amazed that it had worked. Dalen, with a visible madness on his face, looks at Lannery and asks her to travel with him. Lannery spit it on the ground and with a look of contempt tells her brother that he has become a monster. Dalen changed his mood. He goes serious and tells her that then it was the end of Lannery. He raised the blaster and shoot her in the chest. Lannery runs, attracted by the screams. She finds his clothes near Subway Lake. They are torn and wet. She smells blood. When carrying what she can hear, Lannery screams her pain into the darkness. She sinks to her knees and gathers the clothes against her chest. And even as Dal's spilled blood is still warm, her sister begins to cry. She grabbed hold of the force with all she had left and guided it to her. Then, the darkness came. She's eternally chasing Dal. Inside the old city, a whisper is heard in the corner. A laugh is heard in the cavern, ahead of her shadow is seen always just out of Lannery's reach. If Lannery runs, Dal runs more. If Lannery walks, Dal walks more, always one step ahead of her. It wasn't to tease her, but there was always a repulsion between them. The heat she felt invaded her whole body. Trying to move an arm would burst the pain originating from her chest, restricting her from any movement. She was falling through the darkness and could do nothing. Every second made her fall faster. She tried to open her eyes and couldn't. Underneath her, something was making her move. She couldn't tell what it was. She felt a shadow appear before her, it was Tresana, trying to carry her and get her off the place. Lannery was doing her best to hold on, this time, when she fell. The force was there to catch her and, in the agony, she had a moment of ecstasy as she felt it surround her and pass through her. Trey was dragging Lannery, they were on the surface of Sunspot, heading for the Peacemaker. The air seemed on fire. Swaths of flame rolled in the random directions, bursting against each other. Purple lighting flashed before her, splitting into thousands of white forks of fire. Even larger explosions rumbled deep into the bristling atmosphere, swelling outward in bursts that must have been six miles across, while Torra was approaching Sunspot. In the distance, Lannery could hear the footsteps of Iron Horse. She didn't know how long it had been. Tre told Lannery that he saw ships on the scanner leave the mine, and when Lannery didn't return, he went looking for her. He found her with a fist-sized wound in her chest. Lannery remained silent, floating in a sea of pain as Tre reached the peacemaker and pulled her inside. Tre laid Lannery down on the cot, and Lannery with difficulty speaking told him she didn't have much time. Lannery with wide eyes, shocked by all the lessons that Paul had taught her. The master tells her how important and dangerous the alchemy of flesh is. It's a talent for few people, and Dan Paul has seen potential in Lannery. The dark side is a constant presence when you have the alchemy of flesh. It's a strong and challenging power, and one must be well balanced. Dan Paul claims that it wasn't just alchemy, and it's not just learning the art for the sake of it, it's practicing to be the artist. The perfect proportion and harmony of the soul being the individualized essence, the life force in the physical body gives away the manipulation in alchemy. 
alchemy was the tool to increase the speed of a naturally slow process. An alchemist could play with it. Lana returned to look at the experiment she had worked on his spare time. She knew she was talented at alchemy, and she was now in the moment for her final test. She rested her hands on either side of the experiment's small pedestal, lifted what covered it, and the flesh pulsed. A life from cells from Lannery's arm, blood from her veins and marrow, and it has drawn from the force. The vestigial limbs move senselessly, the eyes totally wide, look, but no saw. It had no brain, so couldn't understand, and it was only flesh. The power she sometimes experienced in shaping flesh to his desires was shocking, but now she was finally making sense of his experiments. Trey was on the verge of vomiting. Before Dalen shot, Lander was able to rally behind the force. Without it, the impact would have reached her heart and lungs. She let herself be carried away by the force. She pushed away the pain that threatened to make her sick, the tiredness that lured her into sleep and death. The power was wonderful. She smiled. The flesh before her began to bubble and boil, and without opening her eyes, she stripped off her robe and underwear and leaned forward. Bowen appeared before her. Lanner accepted and embraced his darkened surface, feeling a warm, moist touch on her chest. She sought and found Ashla, a bright spark within the force. And as she experienced herself in balance, the talent she had known in Anil Kesh and had been practicing for so long began to owe themselves. The flesh was due to them. She awoke quickly conscious. She was lying on the cot in cold, sweating and only a sheet covered her. Her experiment was withered and dry, the petrified remains of something long dead. She looked at her chest wound and took a deep breath, startled. Her skin was rough and scarred, and there was a depression in her chest, but the blaster hole was gone. Trey lay beside her, his eyes nearly closed and totally sick. Lannery had never seen the red of his skin so pale. Tress said Knox is leaving too much after effects on him. Lannery dressed and placed Tre on the cot. Lannery was ready to help him with her medical knowledge, but Tress stopped her told her there was no time. Dalen intended to kill Lannery and thanks to Tre, he couldn't. But if his brother go to the old city with the device loaded, he was going to die anyway, or rather, they all would. Lannery took a meth kit and gave it to Trey, told him to take medication and ran to the cockpit to set course for Dal. She tried to turn on the communicator to send a message to Titan and couldn't. Outside, the atmosphere was a complete chaos. The sunspot sky was filled with lightning striking everywhere. The sky was a combination of red and yellow. Malterra was nearby. The gravities battled as each planet exerted influence on the other and it seemed that both were seeking dominance. Lannery knew that taking up the ship and leaving the planet in those conditions was suicide, but she couldn't afford to stay on the planet until everything calmed down. Every second they spent on Sunspot was one second less for Dalen to reach Old City. Lannery took the controls, turned on four screens with space hearts on different scales and trusting her instincts. The Peacemaker shut up the surface of Sunspot into cosmic chaos. The ship took a beating as it exited sunspot atmosphere, but the ship had been built to last. The noise was tremendous and she could barely hear her own screams. Straps cut into his shoulders and chest. The window glowed with the heat outside. The seat creaked, loose panels flew and rattled, and the command control vibrated so hard in his hand it numbed his fingers and forearm. She couldn't let go. The forces exerted between the two planets approached at great speed, ripping and tore through space. Half a million kilometers was the distance between one planet and the other, and flying between them felt like dropping a feather in the winds of the grassy plains of Tals. She fought the storm through the ship, calmed by the force. Instruments went haywire from the magnetic and gravitational chaos that danced between worlds. Even sparks flew from several crevices in Iron head. Her stomach rose and fell. 
she pressed himself against her seat. Time was marching on, every moment an eternity. The ship was being torn to pieces. The hull of the ship had been hit by three beams where the third illuminated a control panel as if it was burning. Lannery's scream was empty. In the chaos, it couldn't be heard. She was prepared for death. She knew it wouldn't hurt, and in the end, the ship endured. They had taken a beating. Life support was damaged, but it would last them until Titan. One of the laser cannons was fractured. A fuel rod had ruptured and thrown her into space. But hull integrity was good and all vital systems were functioning. The peacemaker was well enough to take them to Titan. Iron Hulls was non-functional. Some of his circuits were fried and in need of repair. Lannery will deal with him later. Lannery unbuckled herself from the pilot's seat, stood up, and a vision came to her mind. It felt like a shock, a ripple in the force, far greater than she had ever felt. A ship, a battle, death and chaos. Lannery shook her head. She didn't know what that had been. She had programmed the ship's computer to take them to Titan. Trey and Lannery wondered how they felt and worried amongst themselves. Lannery went to the cot and told Trey to wake her up as soon as they got to Titan. Lannery dreams of a tall figure in a cloak and armor, a helmet, and in the hand, using a weapon, she couldn't tell what it was. She saw a blade made of the force itself. Trey briskly awakens Lannery and points his finger at the cockpit window. A force storm never before seen by Lannery was on the surface of the planet Titan. Chaos was evident. At that moment, they knew that Dalin had probably already started all, or maybe he wasn't. It was very strange for Lannery to see the force storm like that. She had never seen anything like that. Lannery jumped into the cockpit and led them into a dive into the atmosphere that was almost suicidal. Every moment could be her last. The descent into the atmosphere was terrifying. Peacemaker hull cracked and burned. Flames filled the ship's windows. Landry was forcing the ship beyond its design's limitation and pushing it into the danger zone, but there was no other choice. The peacemaker descended over the continent of Tals and headed west. In a moment, communications were able to connect, sending a signal to Master Down Pole. The image of the Master appeared on the screen, but even with the storm, the signal was confused. It was impossible to hear what the Master was saying. Lannery couldn't even tell where the Master was transmitting from. The room around here was clean, modern, empty. Lannery could hear Nancy's words where her master said she was on a ship outside the system. She adjusted the signal and was able to talk to Dan Paul. Lannery mentioned she was heading to the old city. The master asked her to stop dealing because he is about to change everything. Master Dan Paul was about to say something else and the voice disappeared in a crackling haze of interference. Lannery tried to communicate with the master but couldn't. On the scanner, Lannery saw a ship and knew it was Dalen's ship. The ship had landed hard, opening furrows in the ground along a low slope, and then crashed into a mountain. There was no sign of bonfire or explosion. They approached the crashed Stargazer ship, and Lannery's nervousness increased. Her brother might be dead in the Grekish. With the force, she couldn't detect anyone inside the ship. Trey entered through the hole and shone a glowing stick through a shattered door. The interior was chaos. Crushed panels, dangling wires, a shattered seat, and hardened impact foam around the empty forms of at least four people. She could see two bodies still wrapped in foam, and the exposed parts were badly mutilated from the crash. Lannery went in to check the bodies, and none were Dalens. They went to the engines, and they were still hot. Dalen was knocked down by the force storm and continued on foot. They ran back to the peacemaker and Lannery took command and led them quickly across the landscape. 
Lannery landed the ship and they approached the old city. They followed the tracks in the long, wet grass. Her heart was pounding and a sense of impending fear gripped her. They entered the place and she recognized the path she had walked before. A sense of deja vu hit her heart. Once again, Lannery chased her brother beneath the surface of Titan, not knowing what might lie beneath. They kept walking and came across Dan Paul's fear safe word. Apparently, when Lannery spoke to the Master after meeting Kara, Master Dan Paul knew there was a chance that Balin would return to Old City and set traps, the first of which had already been triggered. A Cathar Stargazer had been cut into several pieces, wet flood on the floor, and the severe Cather's head stared down at them from below. On the wall were a number of laser pots, all of them used. They kept walking and she could see that the next trap Dan Paul had set was so obvious, so obvious to Dallin that he avoided it. Troy and Lannery passed through a tunnel, she with her sword in her hand ready for anything to come. Lannery was so focused on detecting Dalen with the force and besides, the dumbbell traps that hadn't yet been activated were a problem for her as well. In an instant, a blast of gunfire to Lannery's left came out of the shadows and Tre behind her pushed her forward. The stargazer was illuminated by the red blaster blast and Lannery raised her sword. She slashed both his arms and his chest. Lannery looked at the stargazer's fearful eyes and threw him to the ground. She wiped his sword and told Tre to be careful and stay alert. Tre could never hear that. A blast had hit him high in the neck, burning the back of his skull. He lay on the ground, still with his arm outstretched. She ran to his side. His nose was bleeding. Lander grabbed his hand and felt his pulse very weak. He was still breathing. She could save him, but Lander knew there was no time. I'm sorry, she said. She left Trey in the dark and kept running. Lannery sensed another stargazer. He was on top of a structure pointing his blaster in the opposite direction where Dal was running. Lannery knew she couldn't interrogate him or be seen because, like in Pandip or Kalimar, they could bring explosive best. She kept silent and moved like a shadow. She jumped on the stargazer and finished it off. Lannery fell after the stargazer's corpse. She felt the heavy, dense power pervading the place, but she didn't care. She was tired and furious. Her balance was unstable. She let herself be carried away by anger. She sharpened her senses. The lower she went, the heavier the darkness became. And then, Dal was there, standing in a room. He had thrown several glowing sticks forming a circle around him. Next to his feet rested the device. Lannery pointed her blaster at Dalen's head. He crouched down where the device was and Dalen told her that the blaster is a very old-fashioned weapon for a Jedi. Lannery angrily told him not to move, but he had already killed her and had a debt to repay. They stood like that for a while. Lannery didn't relax for a moment, finger on the trigger, eyes straight at Dal. He tells her he is not a bad man, he's just fighting for his ideals. He tells Lannery that if she's not curious what's out there, go back to their home planets, where they were plucked, claim their inheritance in the stars. Lannery replied yes, but she wouldn't risk what she knows and what she loves for that. In a last attempt, Lannery enters Dalen's head, showing him images of everything she had experienced and see on her journey to him. Dalen was left with his eyes wide open. He shook his head and grabbed his hair in despair. In a moment, his gaze changed to hatred. With a scream of rage, he told her to stay out of his head and launch at the hair and begin to beat her on the ground. Lannery was fending off the blows, but Dalen had gotten better at fighting since her visit at the staff cage. She was striking back at her brother, but Dalen's fury consumed him. Lannery's sword had fallen as Dalen knocked her down. Then, he took the sword and cut her heel of the hand in two. 
Lana is screaming in pain and threw Dalen away from her. Her brother pulled out two blades he had on his belt and attacked her again. With a great concentration, Lannery threw the biggest force fist she had ever made and threw Dalen through the air. In seconds, Dalen recovered and jumped towards the device on the ground. Lannery didn't have time to think. She grabbed her sword, jumped towards where Dalen was and over her head made on a high arc shape with the sword down. She closed her eyes and felt the blade cut something. Dal's right arm on the ground severed next to the device, fingers still extended. The blade was buried deep in the side of his head. Dal's eyes were stained red, blood gushed from his ears and nose, and then he lay still. Dalen collapsed. Her brother was gone, and all that was left was that sad, mangled body. She turned his back on Dal and made sure the device was stable. She had left the sword with Dal. It wasn't his real sword, and she had no desire to wipe her brother's blood from its blade. Lannery, still besides her brother's corpse, looked at the device, stood for minutes wondering, just wondering if The storms continued to batter Tython as she drove his damaged peacemaker to one of Anil Kesh's landing pads. The ship needed repairs, and her droid required special attention from the experts. Above all, Trey was struggling between life and death. He was in a deep coma. She had done everything she could for him. He needed the attention of someone experiencing force healing. Master Dampol met her on the landing pad hood up to protect her from the rain. She greeted Lannery with a hug and Dan Paul felt the unstable force in her. Lannery confessed to her that she had killed her brother. The two went inside the temple of Anil Kesh to talk. The device was taken by three rangers to one of the laboratories to be analyzed. Dan Paul listens with attention to Lannery's story and everything that happened. She thanks her for her work and says that she hopes Tresana will be saved and swears that everything promised to Tre will be fulfilled. She even congratulates her and finds the experiment that took place on her ship that saved her life extraordinary. Dan Paul had been her alchemy teacher and she hoped she will continue in her research. She tells Lannery that her mission was over, but a bigger story was about to begin. Lannery not knowing what was going on, Here's the master tell her that an alien ship had entered the system and crashed on Titan, near the rift, and its arrival had triggered the Titan Force storms. Different masters went in search of the ship, and Don Paul confesses to Lannery that they fear what happened because a change in the system may be starting. There was a disturbance in the force before the ship crashed. A strong darkness. Also, Master Don Paul says that the ship's crewmen are force-sensitive. Dan Paul tells Lannery that she feels a lot of confusion in her. She tells her that it's normal after everything she lived and offers her help if she needs it. If Lannery feels confused, the master will be supporting her in everything. Lannery, with fear and curiosity, asks Dan Paul a question. She asks her if the Hypergate was real. When she was in Old City, she felt it. Dan Paul answers that it's normal to feel different forces in Titan, like the disturbances of Abyss of Rue. Lannery again insists that she felt a power waiting for something or someone. Dan Paul looked at the bottle of wine they were drinking and stopped to go get another since it had run out. Lannery grabbed the master's robe. They were face to face and asked her again if there was an hypergate. Dan Paul looks at Lannery and reminds her of the great act she just did. Whether or not a hypergate existed didn't matter. She had saved thousands of lives. She tells her that she's an excellent Jedi and it's a proud of her and mentions to her that she may be one of the best but she needs to learn when to stand up to things 
and when to back off, when to obey the master and when not to. Landry, feeling confused, asks her one last thing. She wants to know where the information about Dalian and Stargazers and the device came from. With a nod, Dan Paul affirms something Lanori already knew, and the master tells her that Kalimar is where she should go. One more stop. The ship felt too big without iron hulks and tray. The droid was being repaired by a junior talented in mechanics, and she had been told Tre's prognosis was good. She arrived at Kara's apartment. Everything was empty. She had abandoned everything. The damage from the battle they had against the droids was still visible. Kara's secret room was empty. No one knew anything about Kara. The times Lander used a subtle force trick to read the minds of her partners, she found confusing images of Kara's friend and threat, but no indication of where she was now. She had disappeared and, in addition, other high-level members of the Rolgen community were gone as well. The businesses of all of them had run off directors. They left no trace. Lander knew better. Those people didn't care about the mines they left, the food they traded, the ships they sold, nor the people working for them. Many people dream of the fortune of them all. Kara and her partners looked at more than money. They gazed at the stars. Their targets included the Jedi, and it was in their best interest to give them information. They had all the money in the galaxy to spend, but no their time. Dale and Brock had been an object for a greater goal. There were the machines, and there were the masters. The tools that function and react, and the programmers who use them for their own ends. She suspects that Dal and the Jedi have been a machine, a tool, and that Kara and the real stargazers, the real masters. The plans were going too slow for them, and they used Dalian and Lannery along with the Jedi. They gave them a push to go faster. Lannery didn't like the feeling of being used, and yet it was something that haunted her. But now, Tython was her destiny once again. Her parents were waiting for her, and it was time for their daughter to come home.